There's an echo in the canyon, a reflection on the sound. When I we'll start off with a poem here. It's called Old Poets. Old Poets. <clears throat> If I should live in a forest and sleep underneath a tree, no grove of impudent saplings would make a home for me. I'd go where the old oaks gather, serene and good and strong, and they would not sigh and tremble and vex me with a song. The pleasantest sort of poet is the poet who's old and wise, with an old white beard and wrinkles about his kind old eyes. For these young flipper gibbets, yeah. Flipper gibbets are rhyming their hours away. They won't be still like honest men and listen to what you say. The young poet screams forever about his sex and his soul, but the old man listens and smokes his pipe and polishes its bowl. <laughs> there should be a club for poets who have come to 70 a year. They should sit in a great hall drinking red wine and golden beer. <laughs> they would shuffle in of an evening, each one to his cushioned seat. And there would be mellow talking and silence rich and sweet. There is no peace to be taken with poets who are young, for they worry about the wars to be fought and the songs that must be sung. But the old man knows that he's in his chair and that God's on his throne in the sky. So he sits by the fire in comfort and lets the world spin by. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. A poet has been born. Thank you. And speaking of born, we have Bjorn Peterson. Welcome. Uh, welcome, guys. And Hello. my co-producer, and guest host today, Victor Urbanowitz, been with me four years and counting, well, let's say 64 years, maybe. Or is it 60? Yeah, it's 60 this June, buddy. Oh, yeah. Bjorn, welcome. Thank you for sharing your poetry with us today. We're thrilled to have you. And again, we'll have you soon and again, because you've got a wonderful book out Thank you. Tell us about the book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So yeah, I've got a book out. It's called A Beautiful Amble. And uh, it's a book that I wrote in part because I had several, I've used poetry in a lot of the community work that I've done over the years. And the communities that I worked with would always sort of say, is there a way we could have that, you know, how can you share it? Do you have a book out? And for a long time I said no. So I finally, this last year, was able to put it together and uh, really excited about it. It's been uh, uh, a work of, of a lot of joy and it's wonderful to be able to share it with other people. Wonderful, thank you. And Victor found you, or you found Victor. <laughs> the well, I, book found, uh, I found Bjorn. He, um... I first got to know him uh, when he was doing readings at the beginnings of services at the suburban house of worship where we both attend on Sundays. Uh, I drive a few miles to it. Bjorn just lives a few houses away. And uh, one of the reasons we always go there is that it keeps drawing talents like him. So, uh, um, you were, as I said, we're going to be hearing from a beautiful uh, amble. And uh, I think I've already uh, said what I want you to say for the, uh, uh, from the forward to your book. So I would like you to go right to the first of the poems you'd like to read. And then maybe if there's a pause, I'll ask you about the work that you do that's connected to it. But the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you. Um... The, the poem I will start with is, is called Years in the Making, and uh, it's, it's one that I wrote a few years ago, um, and uh, it kind of sets itself up, so uh, I'll, just let, I'll just read it. I saw a man have a moment 87 years in the making, 
It came in the third verse after the crowd he had invited to sing along had arrived at the end of the known words. He sang from some deep and hidden home that was rumored to be located beyond his liver in an Andean valley. He melted into the melody as herbed butter on ribeye, convincing the vegans in the room to butcher their golden calves. For approximately 23 and a quarter seconds, I saw a man become the whole of the universe in the back back room of the Wedgwood Ale House. I was there on the night he lived his entire life, and I cannot even recall the song. Doesn't matter. I know the man the song sang that night. That's my favorite, truly. And you Very opened nice. with it. And of course, I identify with age 87, just around the corner. But it was so moving mm. in a way because it was the first poem that gave me chills. And I felt mm. the uh, conclusion, that blast uh, into the universe, so to speak, so deeply um, that mm. you really, really pulled me into the rest of the poems, too. I love it. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a really fascinating uh, kind of place. That we, we, I went to a regular poetry open mic night, ah. and there was a, a man who did a um, kind of an, did intervals with his band, and they would play kind of some classic rock or folk songs. Um, and one night, it happened to be his birthday, um, and and he invited us to sing along. And as he was singing, it. The, the room kind of fell away and 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 he just drew us into this moment and you just saw that pure unadulterated joy of being able to share art with with other people art that moved you and that you loved and so um, yeah that was at the Wedgwood Ale House in Seattle uh, where I would uh, attend regularly truly ecstasy creative ecstasy mm. and that yeah. moment um, which the Spaniards call uh, so deeply, um, and the word escapes me now, Victor, help me out. What a, duende, duende, the Spanish mm. call it that moment of ecstasy through mm. the creative process. Um, bravo, man, you got it. Thank you. And most Thank of all, you've got the musical talent. You know, mm. we won't have time today to express that fully, but I wanted you to know your musicality is first rate. I mean, mm. simply the technique and mm. the musical um, sounds are so crafted, so talently. Uh, oh, fantastic. Mm. And so give wow. us some more. Give us some music. Well, thank you. That, I mean, that uh, that means a lot, and I and you know I think a lot about uh, how how I was formed, and and music was a big part of my childhood. I was a percussionist. I met my wife. We were in a in a band together uh, about 20 years ago, wow. and and so music has always been a part of my life, and it, and it actually means a lot to me uh, to hear that that comes through. Um, one of the things that. Uh, Victor and I were talking about, I have another poem here that I'll read in a minute. It's a little out of order, so you'll have to forgive me, but it's called Driftless. And uh, Driftless is the, the name of the region that I grew up in, in, in southeastern Minnesota. And it's named that way because when the glaciers moved down in the, in the last ice age, um, they sort of spared this part of southeastern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois. And so it's much hillier and, and um, big gullies and, and bluffs. And, um, and so that driftless area is, is where I came from. So this poem is called Driftless. And it's a little bit about how I was formed. In country neighborhoods, never more than a block or two from hardwood hiding spots, I spent my childhood where fields and forests convened the hungry and desperate, and no fences or no trespassing signs could stop our wandering. 
where coyotes led the search for our scavenged lives in the wooded bluffs too steep for crops and oaken marshes too wet for houses yelping to say we're still here still growing and dwelling a long loping panting after we sought refuge from homo hedonists who plowed the prairies for fleeting visions hills and rivers making the last stand of a shaven plain unbent by glacier or farmer and we stow away song dogs hid between the waves of driftless land this is the poem that makes me cry because I lived in South Dakota for eight years mm -hmm. and I know the topography and it's so nostalgic for me. I'm so deeply, deeply touched by that one. All oh, those coyotes, oh man, <laughs> you really have nailed that scene so beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. I love the Thank way you, you coin words too. Mm. Um, you know? I agree, yeah. Fantastic. Um, mm. Wow, read me another. Yeah, happily. Um, so, you, you know, the, the land and the, the, the geographies of the places I've been formed by are, are uh, really important to me. And so uh, the next one I'd like to share is called Last Season's Antlers. Oh. And this, this one is a, uh, from an experience I, I had with my wife and son. We lived in Bozeman, Montana for a while. Ah. And we would make a monthly pilgrimage into Yellowstone National Park. Um, and so what we did was every calendar month we went in order to see how the land changed depending on the season. And, and on this particular uh, January uh, afternoon, we were in the Lamar Valley in, in the northeastern corner of the park and, uh, and, and watched this moose uh, bedded down by the the river, uh, and uh, and it later gave rise to this poem. So last season's antlers. Rising from his snowy daybed, he shook loose the antlers of last season, leaving his bloody nubs to glisten in the midwinter sun. As the burden and glory of bygone struggles fell into the reeds. He took his first step into a new season of promise and peril, unrecognizable to onlookers. Who would recognize in his figure the triumphs and conquests to which he'd given so many miles and so much fight? Losing his weapons made him safer from some predators and to others more vulnerable. Were those the last antlers he would bear? Was he freed from dragging armor or left naked in the cold land of his enemies? Yeah, it mattered not. The antlers were no longer his. Adorned or abandoned, the season demanded its due. One way or another, the bleeding would someday cease. Abandoned, abandoned. Oh, you know, the music is beginning to penetrate again, thank you. Um, oh, what a wonderful image that is. Yeah. Bloody nubs, oh yeah. Your imagery, finally, you know, of all the poetic devices we have, it's our basic starting point. Your images are so powerful and appealing and so um, idiosyncratic, they're distinctive. Mm -hmm. No one else writes that way, just you. It, um, it reminds me of years in the making. It has a very effective ending. It's kind of open-ended. Instead of concluding, it like evokes more thought. Exactly. And when he finishes some of the poems, Victor, he actually ends with a question. Mm. He ends with a question, which is, you know, um, something I've never done myself. Um, here we've got a contrast between youth and age, uh, almost screaming between the lines. Here I am crying, of course, with nostalgia 
and memories of South Dakota and the empty prairie, you know? Um, so old men cry by the fire with their pipe. <laughs> their tears drip on the pipe and put it out <laughs> before they nod off to sleep at 8 p.m. And here's youth, you know? That's specific. Fired Did that up. happened to you before? Yes. It's specific, okay. Yes. Yeah. You fell asleep at 8 p.m.? Oh, I was sleeping by 8 p.m. Oh, okay. And it's like, I'm dreaming of Victor taking over a show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll because move to Connecticut just to do that, Frank. Oh, bro, <laughs> you got to come one of these days, bro. Yes, please. You are my heir apparent. <laughs> now that I'm so airless. Oh, I'll stop gaffing. Another poem. We're down to 10 minutes. So for this show. But you know, this is the biggest blessing in disguise. It is what we call synchronicity. It's what we call the universe provides because you'll be on again and again and I'll be thrilled because you're refined. You're refined oh, you. so wonderful that who knew, you know? St. Paul, come on, who knew? Victor knew. Well, thank you. <laughs> Victor knew. Well, I'd like to see the poems, the text of the poem on screen once Bjorn starts reading. Oh, yeah. We've seen a bit of that. It would be nice to have more. Yes. Yeah. Oh, could we have That's some, great. some uh, text on the screen? Any poem will do. Any well, the poem one he will wants do. To read, of course. Oh, the poor things. They're just so beside themselves with the technology, though. Oh, oh, something I knew they could do it. Oh. That's perfect. I was thinking, uh, so A Beautiful Amble is the name of the book, and it comes from uh, this poem that uh, I wrote. Um, and I like, I like the way that mystery and mysticism show up in poetry and, uh. and the way that poems can hold multiple truths or even truths that feel contradicting and stuff. And so... Um, especially the third section of my book is is the deepest uh, uh, sort of exploration of those and this poem opens that third section and so this is called a beautiful amble I must rise only in the form of a great bear to write my living and my life or I shall be crushed by jealous gods they must fear me for they sent me barrels of wine to keep me from becoming like them I have laid down in roads I was meant to travel. I have become a sleeping pilgrim, but sleep is for mortals. And should I let go the cup, I would cause the gods to tremble. I would stretch my flaming wings and light my own way, moving down this road, the way a bear dances, a beautiful amble. There's the bear. Oh, Victor. Oh. Victor, what is your spirit animal? I must know. Victor, I must know. I think know. a marmot, but you know. I said a Norway rat before. Did I keep you say, changing them. Did you say a marmot? Marmot, yeah. Oh. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I've got I guilt cast. I first piece when I was in Catholic high school saying if things don't work out for you, <laughs> change your patron saint. So, um. <laughs> But don't yeah. let me steal the show. No, you won't. This because poem, this poem really requires reading and rereading. Hmm. It's rather mysterious. Yeah. And should I let go of the cup, I would cause the gods to tremble. Okay. Hmm. Okay, Prometheus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 image of. Uh, of gods being jealous and sort of keeping uh, keeping one's power hidden from oneself is, is sort of um, where where that comes from. And and I went through a change. So Bjorn means bear in Norwegian. Uh, and so I, uh, some number of years ago, began to identify more and more with that idea that that I was not just named bear, but I was one. And and it found it as a, a rather liberating um, and spacious way for me to, to think about myself and what I was capable of and, and what I could do. And so 
um, playing with that kind of imagery um, was was really important to me and and it shows up in several of my poems uh bears do anyway um and in fact uh, uh, perhaps we have time for one more um uh, but one of the other poems that i prepared was called spirit bear speaks to cedar sapling and it's a bit of a tongue twister sometimes to read out loud i've noticed um but this is a little bit, this is a poem I read after my son was born. I wrote after my son was born. Uh, and uh, one note is that tokel soil <coughs> is, a, is a kind of uh, red, rich soil that uh, you find in the Pacific Northwest, and, uh, <coughs> where, my, where my wife is from and where I live, I've lived uh, several times in my life. So spirit bear speaks to cedar sapling. A fierceness has grown in my body since the day the sweet nature of your soul emerged from the ruddy tokel soil. You are gentle and strong, loving and brave, caring and watchful. As a young seedling destined to become a great cedar, I tend to you on this uneasy forest floor. You will soar in time, spreading wide your protective canopy and with your alluring fragrance draw to you a multitude of species. You may see the sharp needles or the glorious plumage of other trees and wonder at your soft hands and simple stature. Grow not jealous and do not doubt your beauty for the gods knew who we needed and this is how you were made. Do I not hold as we pass the branches of those great western red cedars? Do I not push my face into their flat needles and breathe deeply their medicine? So it is that I hold your hand in the wet woods and inhale your beauty when I embrace your drooping crown. You were born in unsettled times, but not without a shape into which you must settle. And I feel no strength and know no truth to match this incarnation. This spirit bear curls his body around the sapling and dares the world to threaten your sweet becoming. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. Very powerful. That's male nurturance. Wow. Got it. We are right. down to yep. 15 seconds. So the most beautiful thing I can say is we will return and all the music of the spheres and all the wonderful allusions to Mary Oliver and mysticism that you've got bedded in those poems. Man, thank you. I can't ever thank you enough. It's the best half hour show we ever did. <laughs> so. Wait till the next month. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Please, please come back, come back. And, uh, like early next month, oh yeah, because uh, Victor is a must with you. It's just the old and the young, but it's also the serious, it's a wrap. and the rap is on. So bye for now. Hi. Come back, come back. Bye, -bye. Have thank a good day. you. We need you. We need you. <laughs> if I'm gone tomorrow and you hear this song. Remember there is love for you